detox your liver, it'll enhance your digestion, it can give you clearer skin, it can also just help cool you down, and it's all full of nutrients and goes on and on really what it can do. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. What a treat to sit down with herbalist and author Nancy Phillips. Nancy was someone who influenced me very early on in my own herbal path. Her book, The Herbalist's Way, which she co-authored with her husband, was one of the first herbal books that I read from cover to cover. It's a fantastic book that shows the many different ways we can live as herbalists. Nancy's husband, Michael, passed away unexpectedly a year ago. He was also a treasure in the herbal world, as well as many other communities, including organic gardening and orchards. Nancy and her daughter Grace continue to caretake their farm and orchards in New Hampshire. We recorded this while they were having a snowstorm. As a result, the video is a bit fuzzy at times and there was a bit of a delay, so I did my best to not talk over Nancy and my apologies for any strange blips that we weren't able to edit out. For those of you who don't know Nancy, she's an herbalist, a yoga and Ayurveda instructor, and small-scale farmer. She delights in supporting people on their path to finding more peace, joy, and vitality through healing herbs, healthy food, and strengthening their connection to earth and spirit. She and her daughter Gracie lovingly tend Heart Song Farm, an herb farm, organic apple orchard, and holistic educational center. They offer consultations, workshops, growers' intensives, and healing retreats at their farm in northern New Hampshire. Nancy and her husband, Michael, co-authored The Herbalist Way, The Art and Practice of Healing with Plant Medicines. Well, thank you so much for being here on the podcast, Nancy. I'm just so thrilled to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure, Rosalie. I love your podcast and your books and um, I wish we were in the same room having a cup of tea, but this is just about mm-hmm. as good. <laughs> oh, I agree. And, um, you know, we've been friends on Facebook for a long time, and I've been such a big fan of your work for a long time. And when you like my posts, I get this little, like, you know, little jump up and down and excitement, like, oh, Nancy Phillips just liked one of my posts. So um, it's just <laughs> a pleasure to be able to connect with you even long distance. Yes. Oh, well, that's fun because I figure you have so many people you would never even notice, but I can't resist, especially those beautiful sweaters that you knit. (laughs) You're a multi-talented woman. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They are fun. And my most popular posts, I think. (laughs) Well, Nancy, I'd love to begin with hearing about your plant path and all that's brought you here to the green world. Well, I think that like many, you know, I always loved being outside and climbing trees and playing in the creek. I grew up in a small town in Kansas and pretty much it was in the era where kids just were let out of the house and we went and played for hours and we'd hear them, people holler when it was supper time, you know, to come in. So I, I always loved and was happiest outside. And I also remember playing a lot, like making concoctions and brews. And one of my little favorite books was called The Marsh Crone, where she made her brew. And so I thought, so I kind of think back at that. But when I probably really seriously became interested in herbs was through gardening. Well, I became very interested in natural foods and organic gardening. And we, I had little gardens before we were married. But once I married Michael, we just had bigger gardens and I just kept bringing in more and more herbs, starting with the culinaries first. And then I'd bring in the medicinals and I would love them like 
say Angelica or something, but I had no idea how to use them. So I was just collecting books. I'd haul the books as many herbalists do, haul them to my bedstand, haul them to the wood stove and read by the fire. And I just became smitten like so many of us do. And and then I really wanted to apprentice and I, and choose a mentor. I was attending workshops and things, but I ended up choosing Rosemary and I apprenticed it with her at Sage Mountain. It was a very big group in the beginning. So I was a little overwhelmed and I dreamed of being a more of a more intimate apprenticeship with someone. But after my apprenticeship, I started working with her. And then I really felt that that was my mentorship. And she's really been one of the biggest blessings in my life. I'm so grateful for all of her teachings, as well as just getting connected with the uh, network of herbalists all around the country. And that was part of the reason we wrote our book was because I was thinking, what if I was still back in Kansas? I wouldn't even know about all these conferences and the web of of it, herbalists all around. So wanted to just help let others know the path of herbalism and some of the ways to get started. So I so through gardening, and I think bringing the plants into the garden is one of my favorite ways. I remember like lobelia, I had seen a few times out in the on on pictures or even in the woods, but I just could never remember it that much. But then when I start growing it, then I'm like, oh, now I know lobelia, you know? So if there's a possibility of growing a plant and seeing it move from seed to seedling and to overwin, you know, see it through the seasons, that's really my favorite way to get to know the plants. Hmm. I love that. I'm I'm very much the same way. I, my garden is such a special place and where I learn so much. And I do want to just circle back and um, mention The Herbalist's Way. Because um, so, this was one of the first books that I found when I was an herbal, when I was like wanting to be an herbalist, but I had not yet gone to, you know, any like major from start to finish kind of thing. So I had all these questions in my mind about herbalism and what is it and this is such an amazing book in that it really answers that in such this like very inclusive big way of um you know what is it to be an herbalist and so i remember i got this book it was called the village herbalist at the time and i got it from my library and i got it and i just started reading it and i could not put it down and had to have it in my own um library as well yeah it's just it's a real treasure and answers uh and you know in preparing for spending this time with you i was going through the book again and it really does answer so many questions that people have when they first start on their path um it's like you hit them all <laughs> it's like you knew <laughs> so yeah you know, um, it's a wonderful wonderful resource well thank you i remember my mom when the first the book first came out she says, well, I can get rid of some of these other herbal books because I have yours now. And I said, well, mom, this isn't really the kind of book you're going to look up how to treat your urinary infection or things like that. This is more like the path of becoming an herbalist. And that was the mm -hmm. goal. So, yeah, it was a great pleasure because we got to interview a lot of people across the country who are herbalists in all different ways, which is really fun. And a really fun aspect of the book as well. And um, going through it today, I was looking at all those photos and everybody just looks so young. <laughs> So, <laughs> that was fun to see too. Yeah, that's fun. And that was the first book that you published with Chelsea. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Michael's Michael's first book was The Apple Grower. So he had already written oh, that for was Chelsea before. Green. Okay. And then this was our second second book that we did together. And then Michael did, uh, he's done The Holistic Orchardist and then Michael Rise of Planet. So he was involved yeah. in all of them. I was all really only, yes, <laughs> involved with the the herbal one. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> Chelsea Green, they published so many amazing books and um, yeah, your, you know, all of your books in there, just a wonderful addition to a fabulous, fabulous publishing company. Well, you have some other, you have a really interesting background, Nancy, in that. So you have your herbal background, your gardening background, but then you also have a background as um, in social work, integrative health coaching, uh, Ayurveda. I mean, it's pretty um, interesting all the ways that you've kind of explored holistic health, integrative health. Yeah, I think uh, I always marvel when I meet somebody that's like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor when they're 13 and they go out and they just follow one path or a dental hygienist and they just do that the rest of their life or something. I like to weave a lot of things in. Really, 
all of my um, jobs and life's work, I feel my dharma is some type of teaching. I like to teach. And I think I like to teach because I like to learn. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. you're always learning when you're teaching. You might know something, but if you're going to get up and teach it, then you go deeper and so you can teach it in a better way. So I think that's really almost all of the things that I've, all the fields that I've worked with are some kind of teaching. And even, even as an herbalist, I really feel I always just work as a teacher. Uh, I share what I know about the plants and give people choices about foods and lifestyle choices and uh, the herbs for different conditions, but I'm teaching. And so that's from that sets well with me. But, and then I like to teach other herbalists and get them on the home herbalists particularly and get them on their feet, community herbalists, but yeah. I love that you said that you love to teach because you love to learn. And I really resonate with that as somebody who also loves to teach and who also loves to learn. I hadn't really like, necessarily put it together that succinctly. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Recently, um, I was at an artist, I was doing a presentation within an artist forum uh, on a particular thing. And one of at the Q&A, one of the people asked me, what is, what do you think your medium is? And I thought that was an interesting question because mm. I don't really think of myself necessarily as an artist and, and that sort of thing. And it later came, like later, of course, afterwards, I thought my teaching is, my medium is teaching that's you know that's what ties it all together and that's what i'm hearing you're saying as well mm -hmm. is that that kind of becomes the thread yeah and then working with the plants that's my favorite thing to teach and connecting absolutely. people to the earth and yeah absolutely and i'm so excited that you're uh wanting to share about dandelion today because we were just <laughs> discussing prior to going live that we both have lots of snow on the ground currently, but I'm guessing it's yes. going to be the same for you and that it's going to melt um, pretty quickly. And uh, not long after we're going to have those, those first green sprouts and blooms. And um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so excited. I'm anticipating the dandelions already and excited to hear what you have to share. Nancy. Yes. I guess I, I crave them. And certainly I pretty much drink dandelion almost every day, I bet. But yeah, I had to pick dandelion and I have a little bit of a, a deja vu with this because when you mentioned that I should pick an herb, one herb, I of course wanted to pick something that nobody else would pick and something rare and unusual that I'm really know so much about and I can share these monumental things. And then I just, Dandelion came and said, pick me, pick me. And this has happened to me before, one in my a class, an herbal class, and it was a plant spirit medicine class where we were, you know, had a little lecture where we would were taught how to go out and communicate with the plants and connect with them. And again, I had this goal that, oh, well, I'm an experienced herbalist. I know all these common herbs. I'm going to go to something rare and unusual and get this profound information. And I walked by Dandelion and it was like, woohoo, pick me. I really feel like I could hear it. Like, pick me. I'm like, Dandelion, <laughs> we're already intimate. No, pick me. <laughs> so I did listen and sit. And I really felt that I tried to really to do the exercise and really go deep with dandelion. And I did just feel like this sense of almost like lightning, you know, like this energy coming from the dandelion and the brightness and the resilience and just the importance of this plant. And so yeah, so that all came back when you said pick one herb. <laughs> dandelion is the one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think dandelion, like if somebody said, well, here's this exotic herb that costs a lot of money, but if you get it, it'll help detox your liver. It'll enhance your digestion. It can give you clearer skin. It can also just help cool you down. And it's all full of nutrients and goes on and on really what it can do. It It's easy to seed once you pay for it and get it going. And, and then it's prolific and it keeps coming back every year if you don't harvest the root. I think people would pay a lot of money for it and think it's amazing. But instead we have a big fights with it, you know, or try, many people are trying to get it out of their yard. And it's that herb that people either love or hate or have a little battle with. But anyway, I certainly love it. And I also wanted to pick an herb that I love to use for food and medicine. And also that is important in our orchard work. So I'm going on and on, but. <laughs> 
Oh, no, it's fabulous. Um, <laughs> I Well, you mentioned using it. I'd love to hear everything that you want to share, but you mentioned using it in orchard work, and that just piqued my yeah. curiosity. So, yeah, when we first started our organic orchard, orcharding, we had a few trees when we first got married, but, but then we moved into uh, leasing a lot of land, and we wanted to change a conventional orchard into an organic orchard. And the advice was that you mow down all the dandelions and keep all, everything mowed around the trees, and then a lot of other things that were organic practices at the time. But over the years, we found that Michael called it, used to call it outrageous diversity. The more diverse in your in your orchard, the better. So bringing in all kinds of plants and for the pollinators. In the beginning years, we always bartered or paid somebody to bring their bees into our orchard for pollination time. But we don't do that anymore. Over the years, we've just really courted and made the ecosystem more desirable for all kinds of pollinators. So we have a lot of different pollinators that come. And so right when the, the idea was that you mow the dandelions, especially when the apple trees are in bloom, because you don't want it to compete with the bees and the pollinators. But now we know the more food, the more diversity you bring in, then you have more diversity of pollinators and it's all the better. So we have all kinds of bees and all kinds of pollinators, wasps and different things too that benefit. And also just having the dandelions under the trees is better because they're, the taproot goes in and it just makes the, the ground a little more aerated and porous versus all sod and grasses. Michael does use a lot of herbs, we used to use a lot of herbs and sprays like nettles and comfrey and things like that. We don't so much use the dandelions that way for food and medicine for the, for the trees, but more for pollination mm -hmm. and for the soil. Well, I'm happy to hear this. We have um, 20 apple trees and a peach tree and a couple of plum trees. So nothing like the huge orchard that you tend, um, but a significant amount of trees for us anyway. And it's definitely one of my favorite scenes is when the dandelions are in bloom beneath the flowering apple trees. It was just such a beautiful sight. That to me is quintessential spring brings joy yes. to the heart. Yes. Well, where else would you like to travel with dandelion Food, medicine, joy. <laughs> yeah, so probably my favorite way to use a dandelion is as a tea. And I do do a regular decoction with just the um, dried roots or fresh roots in the uh, in season. Um, but I love them roasted. So it's probably one of my favorite drinks is the roasted dandelion root. And I have to say for years and years, I always roasted mine in the oven, but after reading your book, I tried using it, roasting them in the cast iron pan like you do. And so I like that even better. So that idea of just chopping them up really little, even mincing them and then roasting them uh, pretty low on the cast iron pan will make, it's not really coffee, but it gives you that same deep essence and the deep bitterness that we like in our coffee and and you can lightly roast it like coffee or roast it more for a darker roast and sometimes i'll blend in a little bit of the roasted dandelion with um, the non-roasted because I, I think there's probably more medicinal aspects in the the roots that aren't roasted but yeah so i love drinking it that way that's probably my favorite sometimes i'll mix the roasted dandelion or just the regular dandelion roots and make a chai great winter drink and then i do love to eat it in the the greens i think in the beginning i always ate the greens and encouraged my family to eat them we'd saute onions and garlic until they were really nice and sweet and caramelized and then put the the dandelion greens in there with a little balsamic vinegar and that's one of my favorites and that can even keep in the fridge for a while and uh, it's a great spring tonic and but then I had this uh, older friend she was a little bit older even when I first met her and she's passed on now but Margaret Carr she grew up in my area and she loved the dandelion greens and people of her, she and others would can the dandelions and eat them fresh, but she got to the point where it was a little too hard for her to dig very many. So it was kind of a spring tradition to dig some for ourselves and pick the leaves and things and then bring some over to Margaret. And she shared this old book with me, which I don't remember the name. I wish I would have written it down, but it was a cookbook, but it was so neat because it was like so old that it was just blending making medicine in with the cooking 
and it was just like a, a women's guide to homemaking kind of thing. Anyway, there was a recipe in there for creamed greens and that turned out to be Michael's really his favorite. <laughs> and it's really basically made with a roux and it's quite delicious. So you just saute the greens and then add a roux to it and then they're very creamy. So it, that little creaminess balances out some of the bitter, but you still are getting the medicine in there and the nutrition. So yeah, I'd often make that for in the spring. And then I decided, well, I like them creamy, but I not that I'm above eating a roux sometimes or creamy things, but I decided I would kind of modify something and make it creamy, but just use the tahini and the garlic and the little lemon juice. And that makes it a nice creamy sauce too, without all the thickness and the heaviness of the cream, which can be lovely, but maybe you don't want that much. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so that's one of my favorites, just to eat them food. Thank you for sharing those recipes with us, both the roux and the tahini. I'm so excited for dandelion greens to be here so I can try both of them because they sound really delicious. Yeah. And I want to let all the listeners know that you can download your beautifully illustrated versions of these two different dandelion, creamed dandelion greens recipes at the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. Nancy, I'd love to circle back to the roots that you were talking about because you said something in there that I find really interesting. And actually a question I just recently got from one of my own, own students, which was, what's the difference between roasted dandelion root and raw dandelion root as a decoction medicinally? And when I was asked that question, I was like, well, there's probably less inulin in the roasted. And we know from Chinese medicine and maybe even just the way we feel that when we roast something, it kind of warms it up. Um, but it is different mm -hmm. medicine. And I have to say, I do prefer the roasted in terms of just pure enjoyment. And your simple idea of just adding some raw dandelion root to the roasted dandelion root is just brilliant. And now that's how I'm going to make it from now on. So I love that, just kind of get maybe that raw medicinal value in there um, while we're getting that like roasted rich flavor that I so love. Yes, and get a little compromise there, some of each. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have another question for you for the roots. You know, it's uh, this is something that you and I have probably read a thousand times, that if you leave a little bit of dandelion root behind, it will... Um, then you know keep growing and somebody asked me the other day like is that true and i was like well i know i've read it a lot but i've never actually you know <laughs> cut off a piece of the root and put it in the ground and i, I said also that I, I thought that probably if you plant if you harvested a bunch of the root but left like the crown and a little bit of root and replanted that so you're kind of like taking the bottom of the root and replanting the crown just from what i know of plants it seemed like that mm. might be a more better way but sometimes when you read about it it's like you could leave the bottom half because they say if you pull it up and you don't get all the root it'll just keep growing anyway I'm just curious have you ever tried that is that something I don't think I've ever tested it either I think usually by the time I decide to dig them I'm if they're in my gardens or whatever I want them out <laughs> um yeah. And I don't really know, like I know like with a comfrey or a burdock, you know, it has that really big tap root. And if you leave some, it's going to shoot right back up from there. And I do kind of think if there's some left from a, a big chunk of the root, it would. But I can't say that I have really tested it out either. So, Which is the wonderful thing about plants. I know now I'm like, okay, how am I going to do that? And Because you need maybe like yeah. some kind of marker flag, right? Because you could be like, oh, I'll remember yeah. that this experiment's happening yeah. here, but I won't. So yeah, so yeah. kind of like marker and test it out. And it'd be cool, you know, like a, the tip of the root, the crown of the root, you know, just try different things. Suffice to say, though, if even if you harvest the root, like the if you leave the seeds to fly out, like there's dandelion has no problems with prolific, um, you know, being spread yes. and growing so i think that's why maybe we don't know you and i because they're so prolific and they throw so many seeds and it's kind of like echinacea is very prolific and is going to throw a lot of seeds so i don't bother to try to put some of the root back in on the other hand my uh, black cohosh it does reseed but it's not as prolific so i usually put some of the root back in after i take some out but yeah mm -hmm. with dandelion we don't have to that's one of its great blessings that it's so pro hundreds and thousands of seeds when it on each plant. So we don't have to really put back any in to get more dandelions. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I just, I mm-hmm. wanted just to clarify in case someone wasn't following that when you're talking about echinacea and black cohosh, you're talking about in your garden specifically. Yes. I know echinacea yeah. in my garden is so, very, very prolific as well. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Out in the wilds, like on the prairie, echinacea may not grow as prolific, but the purpurea in my gardens throws usually throws quite a few babies. I'm often, mm-hmm. to be honest, seem sad, but I often weed some out. But and so, yeah, I never put back any of the old root back in from when I harvest. I just start have new seedlings. So, well, as we're talking about different like things that people say about dandelion, have you ever used dandelion sap for warts? I haven't, but I've taught that it can be used that way. <laughs> and I've, I always hear that most everything can be used for warts, is what some people say. <laughs> no, dandelion milk, <laughs> celadine, inside of a banana. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I, I have shared that. So I think it's worth a try. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have do make some, I haven't done it for a long time because I think it takes so long to gather all the blossoms, but I used to love to use Maud Greaves wine recipe for dandelion. Mm-hmm. And she just floats a piece of toast on, like a, and puts regular yeast on the toast. And sometimes I've had some really good dandelion wine that way, but I actually haven't made any for a while, but it takes a long time to get a lot of, to pick all those dandelion blossoms. <laughs> it does. And then especially Let's if you see. want to take off those green, kind of the bitter green bracts behind yes, the blossom. Yes, take all the bracts yeah, off. Like, yeah, and then, then that, that is also. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The um, woman that I apprenticed with, Karen Sherwood, she, we did that as like part of the apprenticeship and I was with her for three years. So like every spring, all of the students would gather the dandelion um, flowers and we'd all process them together. And it was really fun because, you know, we were a group of people doing it. And then, and then she would, you know, go through the process with us of making the yes. wine or the meat were, and then we drink that the following year. So she kind of had this continuous batch. So it was a lot of fun to have that tradition and uh, yeah, a little bit different to do it on my that's own. Special. <laughs> Just like yeah. you said, it's, it's more a fun. Lot it of, just sounds like it's yeah. a better group. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> group activity. <laughs> How else do you like to enjoy the flowers? Well, I know with kids, sometimes I'd have them, have them gather them and we did do a little, you know, batter and make little fritters with them just to encourage them like wild weeds. You know, I actually say that at home, I don't usually make dandelion fritters, but I certainly have done with, with kids just to entice them for the fun of it, going out and picking their wild food and bringing it in. And they are tasty. So let's see. Yeah. And then just, I'll put the dandelions in salads and soups and, and then of course dry them for tea and both the root and the leaves. But mm. yeah. Was there anything else that you'd like to share about dandelion? I think just knowing too that maybe that idea of being drawn, if you're drawn to a plant, it could be what you need. And I remember one woman telling me one time, Oh, she took dandelion all winter and she didn't get colds or flus or anything like that. And I was like, hey, well, I don't really think of dandelion as an immunity herb. But then I was thinking about it more. It might have just been what she needed to bring her more ba- more into balance. So then when we're in more in balance, then we have more resistance and more resilience. So, yeah, I think just that vitality, that tenaciousness and, you know, a plant that you can mow down, doesn't matter how many times people will ask me, when should you harvest? And I always say, you get to harvest them anytime. I mean, I think in the spring, the roots are going to be a little bit more bitter. They get a little more shriveled and not as plump towards the end of the season, but you can still harvest them then. And the leaves we can use all the time, especially if some have just been mowed down and fresh ones are coming up. But, you know, traditionally it's the spring. But any kind of plant that you mow down and it just comes right back, it has all that vitality and um, resilience and tenaciousness. That's what I think it brings to us and a brightness. And it said that they even came over with the pilgrims, you know, the pilgrims brought them. They said they probably didn't bring them so much for food because they didn't eat a lot of greens, but they brought them for medicine. And then dandelion spreading all over North America and on beyond, you know, and the the humans almost died that first, those first few years, you know, but the dandelions need very little care and they just took off. So just remember how that vitality and strength they have, mm-hmm. and then we gain that when we, when we ingest them into ourselves too. Mm, yeah. Beautifully said, Nancy. Thank you. 
Well, I know that you have a lot going on uh, on your farm as a retreat center, as uh, the teachings you offer, and I'd love to hear of what you have coming up there. Yeah, so we're doing a little just envisioning of what Heart Song Farm is without Michael. And of course, he's still there and all his teachings and what he brought to us. So we're carrying on the vision of still continuing with our, our organic holistic orchard and bringing in some apprentices to help with that because it's a bit much for just Gracie and I. So we're offering classes coming up and um, where people can come for apple orchard intensive weekends. And um, mm -hmm. then also uh, Gracie and I are teaching team teaching together this year, which is kind of fun. We're teaching a class. I kind of think of it as my signature program. It's a little different than some of the other apprenticeships, but we call it ancient wisdom for modern times. And we weave in a little bit of the teachings of Ayurveda and yoga. I love yoga and weave that in with the uh, learning about healing herbs. So it's a little mixture, but I think it's a great way to teach the energetics of herbs. Your book is always mm -hmm. recommended. <laughs> and and, uh, and a lot of what you emphasize, Rosalie, that not every herb is the same for each person, for each condition, to learn more about the energetics and people's constitution. So that's a really fun class and it, it does go for eight months. We'll be, have some great guest teachers coming for that. And then we host other retreats and workshops this year. I have Karis Lindrut coming and Rocio Alarcon and Kate Gilday doing different courses throughout the, throughout the season, growing season. So we love that. It's great to have our herbal friends come and teach and share. And like I said, I always love to keep learning myself. So and then Gracie and I love to cook. So we're going to do some farm to table dinners and some cooking classes, maybe online too. So share oh, just weaving fun. food and herbs together. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, I was um, looking at your website and I came across like a, you know, like a testimonial or what somebody had written about the farm. And I loved how they, they were really emphasizing that they, you know, love the retreat that they were on and all that they were learning, but they were talking about how healing it was just to be there and to not be worrying about the email and just kind of modern day uh, things like that. And I just, it's, it felt very peaceful and beautiful and uh, just a, what a wonderful gift to offer people. Yeah. It's just kind of a funky old farm. It's been a farm for many, many years, but I do think when we first walked down our long driveway and there's a nice brook running right through in front of the house and all through the property and the gardens. It does just feel very peaceful. And I, we really decided early on, it was a special place and a nice place to bring people because of the peacefulness and a way to just kind of get away from the busyness. It's very rural and mountains all around. And yeah, yeah so we're, we feel very blessed and look forward to sharing it with others. Mm, lovely. Well, before you go, I'd love to ask you the last question I'm asking everybody for season seven, and mm. that is, what advice do you have for people who are just starting out on their herbal path? Well, there's a lot of incredible resources out there now, so I'm so glad about that. Just, I like to encourage people to find people that are really herbalists when they're checking their resources because they're going to find better facts there. And for personally, when you want to take the herbal path, I think it's it's kind of like friends. I mean, you can't have too many friends, like you can't know too many plants. We're all, our lives are all enhanced by our intimate friends. Just, you know, that group mm -hmm. of friends that you can call on time and time again for all kinds of reasons. And so that's what I would say. You'll have all these friends and you want to keep those. You want to learn all these different plants the different resources, but you find your small cord that you're very intimate with and that you use over and over. As a gardener and farmer, I, I again say, you can't always grow the plants, but if you can, even if it's in a pot, you get to know that plant as it, you know, comes up from the ground up and, and how it, just the nature of that plant, how it is in the world. And so I guess that would be it. Just cultivating that intimate core of friends, your smaller group of herbs that are you're very close with, and if possible, grow them or go where they're growing and multiple times throughout the season so you can really get to know them that way. Mm. I love that. And I love that I'm, I'm assuming for both of us that dandelion is one of those core intimate friends that, that we get to yes. keep growing with year <laughs> after year. <laughs> yes, definitely. One of my intimate buddies <laughs> and I probably take for granted a little bit but wouldn't want to be without 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today, Nancy. It's wonderful to connect with you and, and to hear about the gifts of dandelion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rosalie. It was a great pleasure and look forward to crossing paths with you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Even through the airwaves. <laughs> Even through the airwaves. Thank yeah. you, Nancy. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to get a transcript of this show, as well as beautifully illustrated recipe cards for the creamed dandelion greens recipes. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can also visit Nancy directly at heartsongfarmwellness.com. Again, that's heartsongfarmwellness.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. Thank you so much for your support through your comments, your reviews, your ratings. I read every review that comes in because they're like a little herbal love letter that brightens my day. Like this one. This podcast is fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. I was blown away by how much useful information and history was packed into on the 22 minutes on episode two, Three Ways Plants Heal. Thank you, Rosalie, for sharing your vast experience and incredible knowledge with us for free. Do you love this podcast? If you leave a review for me on Apple Podcasts, I may be reading your herbal love letter on the show next. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. We humans aren't the only ones to love dandelions. As Nancy mentioned, you can court bees and other beneficial pollinators with lots of dandelions in your yard. Birds also love to eat the seeds. One of my favorite springtime activities is watching quietly nearby while birds feast on the dandelion seed heads. So go out and enjoy your dandelions. And if you're inspired, let me know in the comments your favorite ways to enjoy dandelion. <laughs>